Kelsey, in trying to understand how our remarkable brains work, we have to look at the synapse, this area between our neurons. Really a remarkable small place. Mm -hmm. How does it work? So the synapse is the um, site of communication between neurons in the brain. And within the brain there are uh, close to a trillion neurons yeah. and each of those connect with one another in incredibly complex ways and speak with each other uh, in order to transmit information. And there are two components, or really three components to the synapse. There's a presynaptic component and that comes from an axon of a neuron and that releases information in the form of chemicals that then uh, diffuse across this very small space and bind to receptors on the postsynaptic component. And that chemical information then gets converted into electrical information it, in the It comes cell. down as electrical. It comes down as electrical. Converts, converts into converts. chemical. It, it, uh, it, it, it flows across the space, mm -hmm. connects at the postsynaptic uh, molecules, mm -hmm. and then that triggers another electrical impulse going the other way. Right, right. And then that cell, in turn, that neuron, can communicate right. to another downstream neuron. Uh, so, so just to get an order of magnitude here, if there are a trillion neurons all together, right. maybe a hundred billion in the cortex or whatever, um, each one can connect with roughly how many others? Another, with about a thousand other neurons. Okay. So there are about a quadrillion synapses. A thousand the, trillion or a quadrillion yeah. uh, uh, yeah. synapse. That, that's what we've got. That's what right. we've got to work with. Right. And yeah. your job is to understand all of them. Well, my job <laughs> is to understand how one, one works. works. And right. so I'm interested in what are the general principles right. of how a synapse right. works right. with the idea that there are going to be common elements between all the synapses right. in the brain. Right. So this synapse is not just a, a bridge. I mean, there's something happening there. This, uh, because we have learning, we have memory of all these things that, yeah. that yeah. are the core of our mentality. And the synapse is pretty important in, in these regards. So the synapse is definitely more than a bridge. And, and one of the things that's most important about it is that it's what in, in brain science we call plastic. So it responds to experience. It's dynamic. It changes shape. It mm. changes mm. strength. Um, it, there are new synapses being born all the time as we learn new things. So uh, many people, you know, sort of a leading hypothesis is that memories are stored as increases in the strength or the number of synapses that are formed in the brain. So memory and learning is the result of, of a synapse directly, but two aspects, forming new synapses that weren't there to begin with right. and strengthening or weakening, as, as it may yeah, be, yeah. Uh, existing synapses. Exactly, exactly. So how does that come about? Um, there are a lot of ways that that can happen. So there's been a lot of very beautiful work that has um, looked at how, how those changes at synapses happen over various time frames. So we all know that we can have short-term memory. I might tell you something right. that you'll remember for five minutes, but you certainly right. wouldn't remember it telephone tomorrow. Telephone numbers. A telephone number is a perfect example. Um, and those types of short-term memory, we know some of the changes that occur at synapses. For example, when I said that the presynaptic cell releases chemicals, they bind to receptor in the postsynaptic cell. Well, there's some beautiful cell biological mechanisms where you can change those receptors. You can add more receptors, mm. or you can change the sensitivity of those receptors so that when the chemical goes across the, the cleft, the area between the two parts of the synapse, that postsynaptic cell is more responsive to it. So you have fewer chemicals creating a, the, the same electrical impulse. Right, and that will take your memory over a certain time domain. Right. But it wouldn't work tomorrow, you right. wouldn't remember it. And so for that kind of memory to persist for a longer period of time, uh, one of the discoveries is that one needs to have new genes that are made. So you need to have new expression of new RNAs and new proteins, and that really can change the structure of synapses and can change the number of synapses. And that's a much more long-lasting change that can occur. How many different kinds of memory are there? Is it just short-term and long-term, or is it just working memory and then something short-term and then something yeah, long-term? No, yeah. Is it a gradient, or are there really categories? How do you look at there that? Are, um, so the, whole, the field looks at it quite, you know, it's changing the way that the field is seeing it. And there's certainly more than just short and long term. And even short and long term, the way that I define it is short is a form of plasticity that does not require gene expression and a oh. long requires gene expression. Okay. But there's a form called intermediate term facilitation. <laughs> there um, always is. There always is. There's always something in right, between. And right. then, of course, you know, we know it from our own experience that there are very, there, there are lifelong lasting memories. Sure. And there are sure. memories that last over a shorter period sure. of time. And then one of the really interesting fields um, in, in neuroscience right now shows that memories change. Um, so a memory that mm. we might 
think is a very solid memory of something that happened to us gets modified mm -hmm. with, with subsequent experiences. So. Okay, so we talked about how short-term memory can occur by right. changing of the, the, the sensitivity, call it, of the postsynaptic uh, membranes. Right. Uh, short. Now for longer-term memory, you said term gene expression. Right. So let's let's really understand what that means because the genetic structure of all our cells are the same. We have, but but the expression of it in individual neurons and how it works is different. How does that work? Okay. So every neuron has the same DNA in the body. As every um, other as cell. every other cell in the body has right. exactly the same DNA, but obviously gives rise to very different types of cells from right. your hair to your right. intestinal cells right. to your neurons in right. your brain, and. Um, the really beautiful thing is that what happens is that uh, experience changes which genes are expressed. So yeah. neurons will express a certain set of genes that makes them neurons as opposed to intestinal cells. Right. But in addition, experience or stimuli, whether that's something that we're learning, whether it's an emotional event, whether it's an environmental event, um, will have an effect on the genes that are being expressed in the well, neuron. Well, in each neuron, the only thing they know is, is electrical impulses right. that they get from other neurons, and that can be a sensory, it can be a memory, it can be an internal, it can be an emotion, it doesn't matter. From right. the standpoint of the neuron, it's all the same. That's what it's responding to. Yeah, it's, responding. it's responding to hormones, actually, okay, and that's it's right, responding, that's right. there are some gases that they okay, will respond okay. to, and likely they respond to other types Complex of, but you're right, critters. lots of things that are you know, impacting okay. on neurons in the okay. brain from our okay. environment. Okay. Um, and, and those change which genes are being made. So there you have DNA, it gets expressed into RNA, and the RNA then gets made into proteins, which are called sort of the building blocks of the, of the cell. Okay. Um, and so what happens is that when something happens at the synapse, that has to send a signal all the way back to the nucleus, which can because be Because that's a very, where the gene is. That's where the genes are. That's yeah. where the DNA is. And right. that can be a very long distance because away. Because if we have a motor neuron, uh, that goes from the from our motor cortex down to our spine, and then another from the spine down to the the flexors in our ankle. Yeah, I mean that could be, be three meter. feet yeah, a meter, yeah. a it meter can long. Be a meter long. And these are the, the cell body is very small. I mean, it's fit thousands in a, a very small area. Yeah. And and then you have an axon, which is very thin. so you have this huge, Distance. very thin axon. So you have to get information from the synapse, which at the bottom of my spinal cord, yeah. and, and you have to communicate that up to the, the nucleus, which could be in my, bra my brain? It could, yeah, so those are the sort of, so we work in systems where they're shorter distances, yeah, but the relatively they're very long distances. Right. It's orders of magnitude, long, right. bigger than the, than the right. cell body of the neuron. Um, so it has to be somehow transported back, and neurons are specialized for that. So they undergo this sort of electrochemical signaling where you get action potentials and you really rapidly signal from a synapse back to the nucleus. Okay, so Change gene expression, and then you're gonna have new RNAs and new proteins that are made. So that's one of the things that we study. But the other big question we have is that, um, I'm a cell biologist. I love thinking about neurons. There are classic pictures of neurons where you have a single cell body and a single nucleus, and they elaborate these beautiful right. uh, dendritic bushes. arbors yeah, and, right. or, and axons and form thousands of synapses. Right. And that's critical to how we process information because each of those synapses is, is communicating with a different uh, right. partner neuron. But they're all feeding so, back to the nucleus. But they're nucleus. all feeding back to that single nucleus. So we're very interested in how does that information get integrated within the neuron. So many neuroscientists are interested in how is, is information integrated within this complex circuit that's a brain. A lot of people will cut it up into the frontal right. cortex, right. the amygdala, the hippocampus, uh, the striatum. Um, we actually want to understand within a single neuron there's so, this incredible complexity. And so so how that, is that? that is a fundamental question. For a single neuron, what does it process by itself as opposed to being required to be in a circuit to make any, any uh, um, uh, fundamental bit of information? What can a neuron do by itself? I think of neurons as existing in circuits. I think a neuron on its own doesn't have much meaning in its life. They're, you know, they really are uh, responding to other uh, signals that they're getting from other neurons, and I don't want to leave out glia, so we've had a very neurocentric view of the brain for the last many decades. And in That's fact, changing. there are 10 times as many and glia as there glia, are. Glia, which are 
contributing in important ways, though. You know, they used to be called yeah, they used to be called the support cells right, of right. the brain, and now I think there's a much uh, greater recognition that they're playing important roles in the um, information processing mm -hmm. in the brain. So there's you know a neuron by itself, it could certainly respond to different types of stimuli, um, but its function is a little meaningless because the whole function of a neuron is to be able to communicate mm. with other neurons. And they do so on such a vast level. Right. And yet, yet they, they, they gather all this information through their dendrites, could have thousands of inputs, and generally put one output? Yeah. Because they have one axon, thousands of dendrites potentially in one output. Right. And then the output can branch at the end to d lots of different neurons. Right. Right. And so you're studying each of those little synapses right. and how it communicates as, as a whole unit. To the nucleus. And then we're interested in the question of, is there, so one might think that then the unit, the important unit, is the neuron itself. But in fact, we believe it's the synapse. And so we're very interested in uh, local control over uh, mm -hmm. gene expression at synapses. Mm -hmm. And that what we do there is it turns out that uh, gene expression is regulated by stimulation. People talk a lot about temporal regulation of gene expression. You get a stimulus, it changes gene expression in a certain period of time. But we're interested in what's called spatial regulation of gene expression. So how can you regulate genes at this synapse and not at another synapse from a single neuron? And there what's been discovered is that there are RNAs that actually um, are localized way out at these distal sites and their translation into proteins can be regulated. Right at that local right level. Right at that local level. So it's really happening at two levels, happening in the nucleus, happening right. at a local level, happening by electrical activity, by hormones, by gases. Right. I mean, it's this very rich environment for right. a single neuron. Right, right. And so we want to understand that. You know, when I think about plasticity, I'm very interested in how do these synapses change to everything that's happening? And so what's the local control over that? And then how is that local control integrated at the level of the nucleus, of, and that's a single neuron. And then, of course, you know, it's really interesting to try to understand how that's then integrated at the level of circuits, which we don't even get to that level <laughs> in my lab.